Hello, my name is Keith Thompson. I'm president of Asheville Civitan Club this year. I'd like to invite each and every one of you to join us for the upcoming television series, Spirit of Civitan TV. It's going to be on URTV and we're going to be covering some of the important issues affecting our community. We're going to be meeting some of the civic leaders who are making a difference every day in the lives of our community, and making things better for our children and grandchildren, making this a better place in which to live. So we hope you will be able to join us and watch our series as it comes forward. Thank you. I'd just like to say that I think it's exciting uh, for Asheville Civitan to have another great speaker, as we always have great speakers today, uh, and coming on the, the heels of some uh, fairly exciting news in, uh, in the news business in our community. And uh, for those of you who, who hopefully had a chance last night, uh, was our, uh, on URTV at 5 o'clock was our program uh, that we uh, videotaped earlier in the year with... Uh, 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 Police Chief Bill Hogan of the City of Asheville and a 20-minute interview with our own <clears throat> member, uh, Van Duncan, who's the Sheriff of Buncombe County. So uh, trying to maintain our own activities and relevance and involvement in the community, I think we are doing a very good job of that. And with that, I'll invite uh, uh, President-elect Larry Liggett up to introduce our speaker for today. With that, it uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce Jeff Green, who has been here before, so he should not be really new to everybody who had a chance to meet him before. He's our publisher and actually president of the Citizen Times, is that correct? Any bigger title than that? Citizen Times, okay. Uh, he is coming to us, if you want to go back far enough, coming to us from South Africa which is a big place, and I don't know how he got here, but he didn't swim. But he's here from South Africa via Hawaii all the way to Asheville, and he has served for quite a while in Winston-Salem. Winston Winston-Salem. So he's not new to North Carolina, but he is new to Asheville, and he's our publisher. And he is very happy in North Carolina because he's building his ideal retirement home outside of Boone, so he is really a resident here now, so I don't think he's, he may be still globetrotting, but he put down roots in North Carolina. We're glad to hear of him here today because I'm sure he has some wonderful things to tell us about the Asheville Citizen Times. And when you have questions, he'll be more than happy at the end of the program to answer your questions. So keep them in mind so that you can ask him and get all the answers for everything you always wanted to know and are going to find out today. Without further ado, Jeff, welcome to Civitan. Keith and Larry, members of the club, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I think this is my third uh, visit to your club, and it's uh, your great caterer and the food that keeps me coming back. They really do a great job. Um, our romantic notions of the newspaper business in many ways are shaped by some of the great old movies that we all watched. I mean, think of Citizen Kane, the front page, all the president's men, and more recently, the paper. And that's both a blessing and a curse for me as I go around and talking about the newspaper business because most of the time I tell my audiences, in all reality, the newspaper industry is a business just like other businesses and the business fundamentals drive the company sometimes more than the news fundamentals do. And that's not the romantic notions that most of us would like to have. I mean, when last did you see a movie about the business side of newspapering, I don't think one exists. It's always the news side that is the romantic notion that everybody thinks about. But as a new publisher, uh, having come from the business side of newspapering, I have to tell you that in the last week I got totally caught up in the romance. Um, this is a hell of a story. And, um, and we got it exclusively. And uh, I have to tell you, the excitement of that was, was incredible. About a month ago, we got a document that outlined the money that Van Duncan had spent uh, since he went into office in the transfer. And we looked at the document, and it was almost $100,000 that was spent on the evidence room. 
And that just, we all sat there and scratched our heads and said, why would somebody have to spend $100,000 on an evidence room? And that started our reporters digging and talking to people and looking around. And we dug long enough and hard enough that somebody slipped us a copy of the audit report. And it was a, a very funny moment because Clark called me on Tuesday night of last week and said, I'm sitting here in front of my TV, drinking a beer and reading this document. And Jeff, you will not believe what is in this document. So Wednesday morning, first thing, we got the news folks together. We assigned a bunch of reporters to do some follow-up and do some interviewing. And I said to them, who else knows? And they said, as best we can tell, nobody else has it. And my big fear throughout the day on Wednesday was that somebody else would get it. And we spent all of Wednesday secretly interviewing people and looking over our shoulders for TV reporters. And we didn't see any. At 5.30, we watched the LOS newscast. There was no mention. At uh, 6 o'clock, there was no mention. It was a long wait till 11. And at 11 o'clock, I knew we were home free. And um, I had broken Gannett's policy. Gannett's policy in the new media world is you take whatever you have, you post it online, and um, then you follow up in print. And I told the folks on Wednesday, as long as I'm exclusive, I'm not putting a thing online until after the 11 o'clock news. So we posted it about 11.31. And I upped the, um, the single copy press run by 30%, and we sold them all. It was a great, great day for the newspaper from both the news and the business perspective last Thursday. We've continued to chase the story. We've continued to dig, and I think we're in front of everybody still on where the story is going. And the story is far from over. So it's been a great, exciting week for me as a new publisher. And my new staff is very energized. And it leads us really to recognize sometimes some of the things we forget when we work every day at trying to earn a living and trying to make a profit like everybody else. And that's the newspaper industry and the newspaper business is unique in that we have a very special responsibility to our communities. We are the community watchdog. We are the people that make sure that your tax dollars are spent wisely, that your tax dollars are not wasted, that they're not squandered, that the people who are in public office are competent to be there. And it's our job to uh, re report the warts and the good stuff that your elected officials do. And I think uh, the Citizen Times really showed a leadership role in the past week in doing that. And we will continue to pursue this story until the entire story is out. The, the other thing that I think is really important about the, the newspaper in any community and the piece that we are really trying very hard to work on is we should be a community forum for the community. You know, the news stories we write are supposed to be objective, but there are two pages in the paper every day that are not objective, and those are the editorial page and the op-ed page. The editorial is the opinion of the newspaper, and you might be interested in how we get to those opinions. I chair the editorial board, uh, and on that board is Joy Franklin, who's the editorial page editor, Jim Buchanan, who's an editorial writer, Susan Innie, who's the executive editor. We have an outside representative who's a retired uh, editorial writer from West Palm Beach who comes in, and Bill Begown, who works with us. And then I put Cynthia Spencer, my human relations director on the editorial board recently, because she has a somewhat more conservative viewpoint than the editorial board had when I got here. So I'm trying to balance a little bit the political opinions of those boards. But we meet every Wednesday uh, for about a couple of hours, and we actually debate the editorial positions of the paper for the week ahead. And that's always my favorite meeting of the week, because I, even though I chair that board and have a veto right if I choose on any editorial position that the paper gets to, 
It's not a traditional boss-subordinate relationship in that meeting. It's really an intellectual debate, and we try to reach a consensus of where we, where we want to be. And that's not always easy. There are some editorial positions that we have not taken because a consensus was not obtained on the editorial board, and we said we're going to have to continue to debate those issues until we, we do reach some sort of a consensus. But there are other areas where I think we've been able to take some relatively bold and courageous stances. I'm very proud of the fact that I got here just before the last election, and all 14 of the candidates that we endorsed were elected. And um, it was a change for us. We, we, we endorsed some people who we hadn't traditionally endorsed, and we withdrew our endorsement from some people who we'd endorsed in the past. And I like to think that the government of our county and our city and our representatives in Raleigh are stronger as a result of some of the positions we took and some of the things we advocated. But it hasn't all just been news and fun since I've been here. There's been a lot of business stuff that we had to do at the paper as well. The newspaper industry is undergoing some very dramatic change. Now, if you think back to your romantic notions of, of the newspaper, it was always special press runs and extra, extra newsboys running around selling papers on the streets. And a lot of those things are no longer possible in the modern world. The, the days when a newspaper can get a scoop free and clear are getting harder and harder. I mean, last Thursday we pulled something off only in my mind because some of the other media in this town went awake. But in the electronic world, for a print newspaper to get a scoop on somebody means that you've got to be at least a day ahead of anybody else on the story. Because in the electronic world today, as things break, they get posted online instantaneously, they get picked up by 24-hour news channels, and in many cases, the print newspaper can only follow up with more explanation and more context the next day, but they really don't have the opportunity anymore to break too many stories. So last week really was special for us. As with that industry has changed, we have seen a very significant change in how the audience comes to the content we provide. I actually get three to four times more uh, viewers coming to my website than I get people reading the print product. So the website is really astralcitizentimes.com has grown astronomically. And it continues to grow at about a 50% clip. So every month we're about 50% ahead of the same month a year ago in terms of the audience coming to that website. And we continue to post more and more content onto that website. Much of that content which is unique to the website and not available in print. And we've continued to build out a local search option, and local yellow pages, and really we, their website is becoming the centralized information source for Western North Carolina. The hard thing for a publisher from a business perspective is even though about 75% of my audience is now online, about 90% of my revenue is in print. So as we manage that transition from a print-only world to a world that is print and electronic and where the newspaper is doing audio and video and the written word, how do you manage the transition of the advertising business? We've done a very good job on the classified side of doing that, what we call our classified verticals. Automotive, real estate, and employment are all very strong online. They represent about 85% of the revenue that I get on the electronic side of the business. We've been less successful, although we're working on it, on working on the what we call the retail, the traditional retail side of the business, and developing online pieces of that. But clearly that is the challenge of newspaper executives today. It's not a matter of the audience is eroding, which is what people like to think. The audience is actually mushrooming astronomically. It's just the mix of the audience is changing from print to online. And my job on the business side is to chase the money over from the print side to the electronic side as well. 
And that's relatively difficult to do uh, as you manage that transition. I have done some business fundamentals since I came to town. Uh, the circulation customer service of the paper was horrendous. Uh, I've worked at eight newspapers over the course of 30 odd years. I don't think I'd ever seen the circulation department in larger disarray than ours was. So many of our wounds here in Asheville were clearly self-inflicted. We have five new executives in the circulation department and our complaints per thousand, which is our measurement of our customer service to our print customers, is down by 65% in seven months. So we've made very significant progress in once again becoming the reliable by 6 a.m. on your doorstep uh, delivery, which we had got away from. And that's one of the business fundamentals that we just had to fix. We also invested very significantly in upgrading the quality of our executives in the advertising side of things. I have, um, in the last six months, hired two executives from the Charlotte Observer, one executive from the Fort Myers News Press, and one executive from the Sarasota Herald, all of which are bigger newspapers than the Asheville Citizen Times. So I've gone looking for talent, I've opened my wallet, I've spent the money to get good people here, and I think if we are to prosper going forward, as we transition from a print-only medium to a medium that is both print and electronic, uh, the sales skills of our salespeople and our executives to explain our audience proposition to advertisers have to be significantly stronger. So we've made those investments. We also have to print decently. The, the print quality of the paper really wasn't where it needed to be. And I went hat in hand to Gannett in my first week of being here and said, I want three and a half million dollars, which was kind of an interesting thing to do in your first week. And uh, there was much gnashing of teeth. And I opened the checkbook and wrote me a check for three and a half million bucks. <laughs> and so we brought in some German press people who have been here for about five months now. They're completely rebuilding our press. The press is uh, 26 years old and had not been serviced properly. And we've already put all new digital inkers on the press. We put all new spray bars and order controls on the press. And we're now in the process of tearing down their eight units on the press. And we're tearing down each unit and rebuilding them one at a time. We've just finished rebuilding unit number one, which was the challenge because we learned as we went along. This is kind of a challenging thing to do because it's akin to um, driving your car down Interstate 40 at 60 miles an hour while changing the left wheel. And uh, <clears throat> so we've had to kind of do things to our press run and, and, and be creative as we go through this process. And we have seven more units to go. We won't actually finish this entire process until probably the end of September. But at the time that that is completed, we will have basically a brand new press. I mean, the only thing that will be on it that was still there before is the actual metal housing of the press. But all of the electronics, all of the water, all of the ink will all be new. And at that point, I really feel like I can continue to publish a print product that this market deserves and that you folks will be proud of. On the content side, we've also done some fairly significant redesign of the paper. I had mentioned earlier that um, increasingly in today's world, it's very hard for a newspaper to break a national or international or a big story because uh, the internet and CNN and Fox are all over it. So what we have done is we've said, what is it that we can do that is absolutely unique to us? And that's our local news content, the, the news that's generated here in the greater Asheville area. So you play with your strengths. And in the redesign of the newspaper, we have fairly dramatically increased the percentage of local news that's in the paper. We've gone from about 40% local news to closer to 60% local news in terms of the mix in the paper. And we measure that on an ongoing weekly basis against some goals that we have. 
We've also um, really increased the amount of news that's directly related to the activities that this community does. Uh, we started a page called Your News Every Day in the Living section and a freestanding section on Thursdays and Sundays that is really reader submitted and organizational submitted content. Your organization has submitted stuff to us and we have run it. And I know Keith has been happy about that. And we're doing that for all of the organizations around town because we think that's the spirit of the community and that's the things the community is involved in. The other change that you've seen is much more of an emphasis on the things that I think are uniquely Asheville. When I look at Asheville, I think of a thriving, independent restaurant town. I think of a thriving arts and gallery town. I think of a town that uses its beautiful natural assets to its best ability in terms of tra attracting tourism and tourism dollars. So increasingly in the paper, we're starting to reflect those categories. We added a freestanding art section on Sunday. We have beefed up our restaurant coverage and our entertainment coverage. And we've um, expanded the distribution of the paper and a number of the products the paper produces to cater to the tourist market when they come to town so that they can pick up something published by the Asheville Citizen Times as a guide to having a good time in our community. So that's kind of what we've been up to in the last seven months that I've been here. It's been a busy and exciting time. Um, I think based on the feedback I get that most of what I'm doing is, is okay, although I've had some feedback that says people didn't like some of the things we did, but that's the nature of the business. And um, very interested in your comments and thoughts and your questions, and I'd be happy to take any. Yes, sir. The question is just what does a publisher do? Um, if you're a really good one, you do nothing because you hire a whole bunch of people to do it all for you. But the, the publisher role is actually kind of a unique one. The newspaper business is really set up as two independent companies. You have the new side of things, which we now call the local information center. And they're gathering the news. And these days they're gathering the news not just for print, but for print, for audio, and for video. So we've had to train all our reporters to not only carry digital cameras, but to carry a video, video equipment as well. And then you have the whole business side, which is advertising circulation, billing, customer service. So those two companies are completely independent of each other until they get to me. I'm the only executive who's over people from both sides. And so that puts kind of the balancing responsibility of balancing the business side of the newspaper business and the civic responsibility kind of on my shoulders. Yes, sir. About 80, 85 percent. Uh, the percentage of the income from, from advertising is about 80, 85 percent. The readers actually only pay about 15 percent in circulation revenues. The revenues we get from readers don't even cover the cost of newsprint and ink, so it's pretty much an advertising-driven operation financially. Yes, sir. Two questions here. One, yeah. The first question is what's my opinion after eight months of the relationship between city and county government? And the second question relates to partisan versus nonpartisan election for the city council, which is a proposal that's up there right now. I'll, I'll start on the, the partisan one because I got a quick answer for that and then I'll spend a little more time on the others. Um, the paper is editorialized against making the city council elections partisan. And the reason we have done that is because North Carolina law makes it very difficult for somebody who's not either a registered Republican or a registered Democrat to run for office. 
And Asheville's a pretty ornery and independent town, as most of you know. There are actually about as many registered independents as they are registered Republicans. And we didn't feel like those independents should have to declare a party to run for city government. Uh, the idea of city government is that it shouldn't really be something that's political. It should be something that is what's needed for the community. And so we've taken a no partisan uh, election stance there. In terms of my perceptions of the city and county, it's, it's very interesting. Um, in many respects, you know, the city of Asheville is like Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, you have this incredibly liberal uh, element in the city and then some very conservative elements in the county and certainly the surrounding counties. Uh, it's, it's guaranteed that almost on any editorial position I take, I'm going to take heat. And um, the whole goal in my mind is if I get as many complaints from the left as I do from the right, I probably threaded the needle about right. And so that's kind of how I try to work on things. In terms of county government and city government, I, I've talked to Terry quite a bit about this, and I've certainly talked to Nathan Ramsey about it. I think that some consolidation of city and county government makes sense. I don't know that total consolidation is the answer because there are too many interests that would be hurt by that, and you probably couldn't get it done. But I think we should start with some non-essential areas such as maybe parks and recreation and some other areas and see if we can't consolidate departments and do stuff together um, so that we can reduce the duplication of services and therefore the expense to the taxpayers. Um, it's interesting, Terry seems to be softening on that some. She was originally very opposed to any consolidation at all. In the state of the city address she gave recently, and I think she came out and gave the address to this club as well. Uh, she opened the door for some consolidation, and I think that's an area that the paper is going to continue to pursue editorially. Yes, sir. The question is, what's the bottom line for the publisher to get the story out first or to get it out right? And that's that's an interesting question. Because it really is a balance. I mean, we do not want to get beaten on a story. So we do like to get the story out. Um, I think what we're, we're going on more now than ever is rather than doing months and months of investigative reporting, which used to be the old model, we're tending to break what we have and then chase. And that's very much what we're doing <clears throat> with the Medford story. I could have held off on the Medford story and had reporters work for you know, a couple of months and try to dig out everything they could. And I decided instead I've got, I've got the audit report. It's a pretty damning document. I'm going to start with that and we'll dig after that. Uh, on, in the wake of the Medford story, we've filed um, about eight or ten freedom of information requests for the county for documents we want. Um, they're gnashing their teeth and scratching their heads and trying to figure out how not to give them to me at this point but I'll sue if I have to. And um, we're going to get to the bottom of the story, and it means a lot of ongoing digging and much in the way of follow-up stories. Uh, Mr. Green, we appreciate you being here today. And we wish you luck in uh, continuing to uh, ride the waves of excitement on uh, your news stories and uh, staying in the the business end of things, because we know if you can't keep the business open, we, we won't be reading the paper every morning. Uh, and with that, we are adjourned.
been a prosecutor for years. I've been a prosecutor here with Buncombe County for quite a while. I've known Kate for quite a while from the actual high experience, and I've known Kate much more specifically the amount of work she has done with caring for children, which Kate mentioned. Kate is a member of the board of caring for children, has done a lot of work with caring for children and trying to help caring for children through some of the problems that they've had working through the system along with her juvenile justice program. She works very diligently with that.
also expanded our crossroads program for caring for children to have a job counselor. And we expanded our SOS, the YWCA, our SOS after school program so that there, we could serve more middle school kids because we can keep them in the after school program. and we now 
mostly where we're getting that intelligence information is intake at our jails and probation. Because gang members, contrary to what you might think, are generally proud to admit their affiliation to gang. They will tell you, yes, I'm a blood, yes, I'm a crap. The female gang members are less likely to do that. They're kind of smart and denying involvement in the gangs. Um, we're seeing, because we see some actual affiliation with the national gangs, we're starting to see some of the national behaviors, drive-by shootings, um, or defined wearing band colors. You, you might have had 10 years ago or five years ago, they were in gangs that would just use the bandana. You might have the red bandana or the blue bandana, have it in the pocket, and we're seeing them fully dressed out in national blood symbols or national blood regalia or we have gang regalia. Some of that is because the gang members that were, by the time we see them in the prison or probation system, they're usually the older, more well-developed gang members who have moved up from the ranks, and they're recruiting the young gang members and the young minorities. And so it's really important now for the younger members to be affiliated with the actual dress and, um, and uh, kind of creepy behaviors, sign gang signs, actually behaviors. Right now, in our local criminal record system, we've got 31 young gang members. That doesn't seem like a horrific amount, and it technically probably isn't. The problem with having 31 known gang members with national um, gang ties is the recruiting potential. That's why the prevention end is so very important. Because these guys are recruiting kids in projects as young as eight years old to affiliate with their gangs. And they'll take the cell phones in, give it to the kid, pay the kid a certain number, a certain amount of money to watch for the police to handle the projects. So while the gang activity may be going on in the projects and drugs only may be going on, Little kids are sitting at the entrance to the housing projects or the neighborhoods that are participating because they're not all housing projects. And they'll call on the right cell phone, they'll get the cell phone to the next town, and they'll tell them that five dollars or po po the police are coming in the project. So if they end up with the activity, they can go underground. The gang activity focus really was driven by an increase in shootings. You can see the statistic up here in PowerPoint. Um, between 2004 and 2006, while we were working on getting our money and our paying our money, there was a 21% increase in shooting assaults. That's really bad. We also had a gun buyback program um, that we were hoping kept down the shooting incidents. So if we hadn't had that, there's a possibility that that 21% number would be even higher. Many of these shootings did appear to be gang related, and that makes it difficult to say we have a shooting like that. If somebody does get killed, there's always a potential, and you see on the message, there's always a potential for retaliation from relatives of gang members from outside the county. And that's really happening in Buckham County. <coughs> We've had a couple pretty good alerts about that in specific shootings that I personally have been involved in looking at the um, police review or the prosecution of them. And after the shooting happens, we're on kind of alert status for a couple of weeks for further violence um, in the areas. And these are some of the weapons that were seized from gang members in Buckham County. That's for training, and that's the graffiti. And some of you will recognize this now. You'll be driving by it, and you won't realize it's gang graffiti. There was some gang graffiti on the dumpster from Aunt Perriman, um, just past the Exxon station, where the underpass is, that I missed. I didn't know this, and I serve as chair of the Buckham County um, Gang Violence Prevention Project, which is a project that we got the grant money for, and I didn't realize that it was gang graffiti until we had one of the guys from the Foothills um, the Correctional Institution expert here. And he showed that when he went in and took a picture of it, and I recognized where it was. Uh, this is just defining this is where this was in the Cornfence Apartments, and it's showing that the Fort Trey gang is affiliated with the Crips, actually. And there's a bunch of different symbols you can see that are right there. You're seeing the FTG. I can't make out um, the 43G or the 43GC, but the 43GC, the four is because there's an F in it, the three is because there's a T in it, so it's FTG for Forte, Fortre Gang, and the little C shows the critical affiliation. And you can drive around and actually see that in your neighborhood. I mean, I feel confident that no matter what neighborhood you live in, because I've seen it all. There's more for others, the additional tagging of the 43GC. When you see that, you 
especially like say with the free gene over there, that wouldn't necessarily mean anything to you if you didn't learn a few things about gangs, because you would think that, I mean, I would think that that one on the upper right hand corner was related to some kind of utility work that was supposed to get done there. But, I mean, really and truly, you don't realize that you're driving in a neighborhood where the gang is really more its territory. That goes beyond tagging, because tagging, you should, you should see some graffiti art with it, and there's no art there. That's just marking territory. That's more, and that's the entrance to McCormick Heights apartments, slob killer in blue, that they're blood killers because slob is a derogatory term for bloods. You can see how bad that is. It's bad enough to be called blood, but then when your rivals refer to the slobs and other kind of slob killers, you can see the picture of the angel. Mm -hmm. South side squad is another um, gang that's been identified in Buckham County. That's affiliated or so far associated with our street, street, and the street, and the street. And you can see the tag there, SQ for squad. Screen actually has a person. This was part of our newspapers. It makes me kind of sad because we saw him in juvenile court when he really was just a young boy that had gone astray and had some problems. I'd like to think at least he had some potential to stay alive and be rehabilitated, but that didn't happen because he was he got killed in Buckham County a couple months ago, and that's some of the shivers. And here, show you. After he died, they did this tag in Hurston Street apartments that was kind of from like an, an epitaph to him from a gang perspective. They memorialized him with RIP and OBSQ um, because of Ahmad and the Ramad, South Side Squad. That was one of, that was one of our kids. That, we saw him if he was ever in any of the caring programs, but he had lots of opportunities to be okay, but the whole the lure of the gang was just too much for him. That's more the South Side Squad tagging. Uh, that is pretty much self-explanatory, and maybe sure this slide might be it, so hopefully it isn't. You can see the clothing, and that is an example of the hand clothing. You can see the tagging on the hat, the VG for blood gang. And that's, I have not seen too much of the gang travel and the gang uniforms in, the, in just travel, in general travels throughout the neighborhoods in Asheville. But you can see more and more of that. And you see some of that at the mall. Our assessment will um, kind of help you with that if you look through the assessment when you have an opportunity, when you're trying to determine how bad is the problem and how safe are we in our neighborhoods, the assessment showed that people at the mall who answered surveys felt like, or kind of revealed that the young people thought it was just dressing and that there wasn't really any danger, and that the older people tended to dramatize it, as I think I may include it in the assessment, because there was just a fear about it. I haven't seen any behavior in my time. I have seen the dress, I've seen the unique dress, but sometimes that's just poor fashion choices. There's more tagging. Um, that's at Lake Hill Village Apartments. And you can see the bottom of that, that we don't know what we're looking at. We don't know what we're looking at. I actually okay. I see the Bloody Night of Blood Nation affiliation tagging there, but that's something that we don't have a lot of intel. That's on our homes gang. Um, again, little intelligence on that. But that does bring to mind something that I saw on one of the broadcasts of the city council meetings. There was a woman from one of the housing complexes, and I could be mistaken. I thought it was Klondike. It could have been you, and she came forward. And, and as she came forward, I was sitting on the sofa with my husband, and I, as soon as I saw her, and she started to realize who she was, that she was associated with the name of the residence councils in the projects. I got a panicky feeling as a prosecutor with 20 years of experience, and I said, my husband, she should not be on television. And the first thing she said after she introduced who she was is, I can get killed for being on television. That's a really sad thing, but that's
that's really true because that's somebody who's part of a neighborhood residence council that is trying to make housing projects a safe environment for all the little kids that are living there. And she can't really do it without coming forward. And if she comes forward, it's very possible that some gang member will retaliate against her or her children for doing that. Um, that's how serious this series of matter this is. You don't have to live in Charlotte to recognize that someone can really seriously be in danger. One of the things that our gang department's prevention project seeks to do is expand over the next two years if the legislature appropriates money to have an outreach component so that we can have a trained person going into the community and trying to talk with gang members and with gang members and with gang recruits, trying to break this up before, break the cycle up before it gets too deeply perpetuated. And one of the things that I said I would require as chair before I would ever agree to anything like that is that the outreach worker have basic law enforcement training because this is really serious and people have good hearts and they think, well, we'll go out and we'll do something about this. And I really don't want a young gang member to target the outreach people um, and and play on and prey upon my tag and good heart and actually kill somebody to do something about this. Um, opposition tagging, you can see what that is. Um, that's just showing you what they when you see the 83 GC, 43 GC. Again, that's not for installation of gas line. That's that's really bad gang tag. Um, that's a neighborhood. I think toward the end of Kenilworth, and you can't really see um, the gang dress in it, but you might be able to imagine that if somebody from that group engaged in criminal activity, it would be very hard to identify them. They're all wearing the same kind of shirt, the same color, the same pants, and they generally do have the same hairstyles. Um, the intelligence we have just tells you where our identified gang activity is. Now, um, one thing that I'll, I'm going to caution you about is. This is my actual city police. We have a separate and different intel from the county. The county and the city are doing, to my way of thinking, an excellent job of coordinating with each other. The relationship between the sheriff's department and APA is really great, um, and they are sharing intelligence, but this makes it look like all of the gang activity is happening in dealing with conduct, rooms, and nursing, and Hillcrest, when in fact we do have some problems in the north end. sharing resources, profits, and expanding the drug territory. That, of course, does not put to any good things because the whole goal of prevention is to keep them from engaging in the very activities that endanger us and land them in prison. This prison is not much of a future for our youth. I appreciate so much everything that you all do and people just like you and other civil organizations do to provide scholarship opportunities, to encourage people to seek educational opportunities, to do anything to break the hold and the lure of the gang recruiters on the youth. Do you have any questions about gang activity? Or, okay, can we get the mic to you, Mr. Potter? What the uh, activity is in the housing projects? And is there any stigma attached legally uh, for membership in these gangs? Is, is anything done to prevent that? Stigma, do you mean is there an enhancement for if you commit a crime and you're affiliated with the gang? No, I mean it's... ...result in any legal consequences, I assume, to be a member of a gang? I've 
I've seen a lot of laws that got passed with the very best of intentions, but actually carrying them out is virtually impossible. They're very, very, very difficult. And then that just um, disillusions the public with the criminal justice system. And what I've seen with enhanced sentencing, we've had enhancements for other things. And the Supreme Court has struck them down and said, well, you can, you can use the enhancement, but you have to prove it to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. So that adds another layer of um, basically procedure that we have to get through in order to put some teeth in the actual law. So the constitutional protection is that you have to prove the enhanced part to the jury as well. So of course you've got to try for the act and get them convicted, which is no easy feat because you've got to convince 12 citizens beyond a reasonable doubt without a unanimous verdict. <laughs> that's, why there's, that's why you see so much plea bargaining because of the numbers and murders. People, I, if I take one minute and just tell you about that, even though that's off the question, a lot of people would feel, would probably have a little more faith in the criminal justice system if they were able to learn about plea bargaining. The reason plea bargains happen is because we run probably 4,200 felonies in the Buffalo County courts every year, and we only have 45 weeks of court, so you can do the math. We have to have 100 jury trials a week. And Very good. We appreciate your work in the community and uh, helping to uh, uh, administer justice. And we uh, are especially uh, hopeful that uh, life will continue to have hope of getting better. That's, that's our mission. That's why we are so here. That's why we do what we do for the children in our community. And we would like to think that your job is made easier by what we and others in our community who reach out and work together and embracing the children in the community can do so. Hopefully your job will get even easier because of so many good people in our community who reach out and, and lift up children. And, uh, with that, uh, thank you. And Hello, my name is Keith Thompson. I'm president of Asheville Civitan Club this year. I'd like to invite each and every one of you to join us for the upcoming television series, Spirit of Civitan TV. It's going to be on URTV, and we're going to be covering some of the important issues affecting our community. We're going to be meeting some of the civic leaders who are making a difference every day in the lives of our community, and making things better for our children and grandchildren, making this a better place in which to live. So we hope you will be able to join us and watch our series as it comes forward. Thank you. Was it? <laughs> Doesn't lose its flavor in cooking.